<laughs> okay, sorry for the delay. My name is Vlad Pario, I'm part of the team, and today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, end user services integration into OpenSeps. We'll be dealing with integrating WebRTC into your existing OpenSeps based platforms. I'll be talking a little bit about MSRP and also about some push notification integration and how to do that in an uh, optimal way with uh, OpenSeps. So, first of all, let's start with WebRTC. A little bit about uh, what is WebRTC and what it tries to do. Basically, in short, it's a project that enables web browsers to offer real-time communication. And here we have basically the architecture of WebRTC and what it specifies. Uh, basically, if we look at this architecture and the uh, context of, of us trying to integrate with OpenSips, Sorry. We see a couple of things. First of all, WebRTC doesn't mandate any signaling protocol. So basically, WebRTC just deals with the voice, video, and transport of the media. So there is no standardization regarding signaling. You can have SIP over WebSockets, you can have H323 over WebSockets, so there is zero limit on that. Also, if you look here, as a um, Web, uh, WebRTC explicitly demands um, media encoding, encrypting, sorry, via the usage of SRTP, which is again, which again might be troubling if you have an existing network that doesn't support SRTP. And also, WebRTC introduces a couple of new codecs that you might not have supported before. The major one that needs to be supported in WebRTC is Opus. So, these are basically some limitations that we might encounter when trying to, to bring WebRTC into our web platform. Here we have basically how SIP over WebSocket, which is the signaling part of WebRTC and how it works. So basically when your uh, client tries to uh, initiate a session, it goes to your SIP to WebSocket server and then basically sends an HTTP GET request over TLS asking to initialize a new WebSocket channel. The server will, will send him one-on-one -on -one switching protocols and then the communication of SIP over WebSockets uh, happens directly over that signaling channel. So let's see how do we put all those things together in a usual SIP network. So basically, as uh, Ali also showed, this is basically how a regular, typical SIP network would look like. You have your core over here with the routers, the media servers, and you have some SBCs handling some traffic on your phones, fronts, or whatever. So if we want to integrate WebRTC into our existing platform in a lightweight way, we basically just have to, do, to put a gateway to act as sort of an SBC, but it would be more than our existing SBCs. It would take the WebSocket traffic and everything, the media, with the transport, and convert it to regular UDP SIP and SRTP to RTP conversions and all those things. So if we look into what the gateway has to do, over here we have the generic WebRTC traffic, which, by the way, this can be uh, multiplexed. You can have the transport and the media and the stun and all those things over one single uh, TCP connection. And basically our gateway will have to extract the SIP over WebSocket and convert it to regular SIP over UDP. And also take care of the media. We'll have to convert from SRTP to regular RTP and also do, if needed, to do uh, decoding from, let's say, from Opus to G729 or whatever you uh, support in your network. So basically the idea is we don't want to change anything in the core we just put a uh, WebRTC gateway that converts things for us. And the main reason for this is complexity and performance. We don't want to push the entire HTTP traffic and WebSocket traffic, in the end TCP traffic into our core. We want to keep things simple and use UDP and whatever and to use <coughs> everything we already have. And the tools you can use along with OpenSIPs for these there are a couple of choices to be made. You can, a simple WebSocket to SIP gateway is over SIP that we are, we are usually using in conjunction with OpenSIPs. 
or there is a full stack which takes care of all those things for you, which is called WebRTC to SIP. So it basically has the <coughs> gateway converting from SIP over WebSockets to regular SIP over UDP. There is so-called RTC Web Breaker, which takes care for you with dating from SRTP to SDP, <coughs> and also the issue with ICE, and also it does coding and coding from one site to another. And obviously, in terms of clients, you can use SIPML5, which is fully open source. You can just take it, customize it, and assess it in your, uh, in your website, or use JSSIP, which is basically a library that you can use to build your, uh, your custom uh, <coughs> WebRTC client. And I'm um, just going to show you a little bit of work, simple work that we've done. We've integrated SIPML5 into the OpenSys.org uh, demo platform. I think this is working. Yeah. That's so is the public OpenSys.org service that you, um, you can use for web calls. And uh, alongside all the, the, all the other things like uh, speed dial, voice box, whatever, voicemail that you have, we also added this tab, which is basically um, the CPML5 client. Okay. So you basically just have a simple uh, login button. And then when you try to dial somebody, it will go to the uh, over SIP gateway that converts it to uh, regular SIP over UDP. And then it goes to the open SIPs that's hosted on the opensip.org uh, server. So uh, it's sh I'm trying to call Bogdan and <coughs> just make a test. If he wants to answer. OK, that's him. Yeah, I just cool. muted. I just muted him, so <laughs> you can't hear him anymore. Uh, so uh, doing all those things is, is really simple to configure, and that's exactly the architecture that we have used. So what did you use for media? Uh, just a second. I have the wrong presentation. So for media, there are basically two things. If you want, just WebRTC traffic to WebRTC traffic, you basically don't have to do anything because the, the flow will be directly between clients and they both support SRTP, they both support uh, ICE, and it will all work. If you want to use the WebRTC client to call to PSTN, well, then it gets uh, nasty in the sense that you have to put that media converter and coder decoder in the middle to take care of, uh, because obviously the carriers don't talk SRTP. They don't know most of all, they don't speak Opus, so you have to do the conversion for them. So basically, it's this part here. But for WebRTC2, WebRTC, you don't need uh, anything more. So what kind of, is there any media engine that can do that? Yeah. Uh, as mentioned here, there's this thing. And I also think there is... Uh, Art of engine? Yeah. Media proxy ng, or I don't know how, how it's called, <coughs> but yeah, you can. You have multiple options here as well. Free switch support the here. Right? Yeah, and uh, obviously, yeah, free switch. <laughs> if but yeah, we're talking about just media related. You know, free uh -huh. switch is kind of a bit more. <laughs> so, in terms of the free switch and the uh, open sips uh, for WebRTC, what would be the reason for using the open sips when free switch already has a has this insight and uh, how can can open uh, help free switch with the with the scalability or something like that? 
Well, uh, the entire idea is that we do not have explicit WebRTC support in OpenSips. So basically, you need a gateway to take all those WebSockets thing and convert it to regular SIP over UDP that uh, you, you can further process. So that's, what, that's the entire idea, to keep your network as it, as it is, don't change anything about it, and just put a gateway that talks WebRTC to, to your normal platform. Don't want your clients talk to FreeSwitch directly because then you lose all the features that OpenSix provides, like load balancing, failure yeah. routing, and all that. Not rules. Okay, so um, moving on to MSRP. Uh, what MSRP <coughs> is, is a mes message session relay protocol. It's basically a generic protocol can, that can be used for transmitting a series of related messages. It, it can be used for anything starting from regular IM, file transfer, photo transfer, screen sharing, or whatever needs to be transmitted in a telecommunication session. And uh, again, MSRP is not SIP, although it has a very similar syntax to SIP, HTTP, those kinds of protocol. But still, MSRP session is constructed through the SIP offer answer model. So basically, when you want to send a file to MSRP, you first create the SIP session, and after that, you will uh, send your file. And again, another thing to note is that MSRP is not defined for UDP at all. So let's see how this works. Basically, uh, we are assuming that you have here your SIP box and your MSRP relay. It's in a sense, very similar to how you route your regular media. You have your SIP box and you have your RTP proxy or whatever that handles the proxying of the actual media from one SIP to the other. When Alice wants to send, for example, a file to Bob, the first thing it will do, even before initiating the SIP traffic, is to authenticate the MSRP relay. Uh, it will obviously receive a 401 and provide the credentials, and the MSRP relay will uh, give him uh, an MSRP URI where he can be contacted for, um, for future sessions. And then what the Alice phone will do, it will just take that MSRP URI and put it in the SDB of the invite. And uh, it will send it to the proxy, and the proxy will relay to Bob. And again, before answering anything on the SIP side, to make, uh, to make sure that he can successfully process that file that um, Alice is trying to send, uh, Bob has to also authenticate to the MSRP delay. And after that is successful, the traffic <coughs> just goes both ways. So, again, if we look at this diagram, there is no need to have anything in OpenSips to explicitly support MSRP. The only thing where MSRP appears in this traffic is just in the user's SDP. So if you do not touch that, you, can, might, you might as well keep those two entirely separate. And the only thing that you have to take care of is to make sure that the authentication, uh, the MSRP authentication and the SIP authentication both use the same databases. Because obviously in the client, you don't want two different passwords when you try to send the file well, compared to when you try to make a regular call. So in order to integrate MSRP internet into your existing platform, you don't have to change absolutely nothing in your open SIPs. Uh, in your SIP infrastructure. You just have to configure a new MSRP gateway. And it's very important to configure the MSRP relay to share the OpenSIPS database for authentication with the subscribers. And what we use usually use for such a thing is MSRP relay. It's, again, an open source software from... Question, question. Sure. Uh, the authentication session, is it for per, per session? Or is it for... Is the MSRP updated every single time? Uh, I want to transfer, initiate MSRP session. <coughs> yeah, you have to authenticate every time you want to initiate the session. But after you initiate the session, you can send as many files or as many things. But it's just for initiating the initial session. What what you do as part of the session, it's it's up to the clients. But why do you need an authentication if you're already authenticated with OpenSense? It's just part of how MSRP is is designed to work. I really, yeah, like yeah, I find different protocols. Yeah, as far as so I it's, it's, it's right? it, MSRP, MSRPS, but that's 
by two HTTP or SIP? It doesn't really matter. It's it's a matter of implementation. So why does it need to know the token? Because the token is the thing that the uh, notification server uses to identify back the phone. So basically, it's the thing that the notification server knows. Okay. It, I think it's for privacy. You have to have the app on the phone where it and yeah. it's it back to you. But the, the notification server needs to know the token, but not the open SIP server, right? It does because it does. when you send notifications, yeah. you have to send the token that the device is looking for. Because let's say in order to, to actually identify your device, that you need something, as you said, for privacy. Like, don't use your, your mobile number, don't use something like that. So it just generates a token for you this time, and then the server just has to send that token. I did something like that. When they register with my server, I told their token, mm -hmm. uh, keep it in my database, and every time that user is called, I yeah. update it. In that yeah, that's exactly the way that uh, it should be done. Store the token in the database, in the subscriber exactly. table, and when it's needed, just Send it to the notification server. Plan? Yeah? How do you park the, the request, the invite request in the script? Do you do you block it in the process or? Okay, I'll, I'll show you yeah. in a couple of uh, <coughs> minutes. The idea is, is not to block, because obviously it can take a long time. And uh, you can't have a request block for, I don't know, two, three seconds. Maybe it's 12, it would be nightmare. 12 yeah. seconds. Yeah. For the push uh, So. notifications uh, an open source one so I'm just gonna go to I'm just gonna use something on my computer and then show you how it's done so if you just look now there is no nobody registered and if I just uh, run CPB to dial the script it will just start my SIP phone and uh, accept the call or okay. <laughs> with the idea the phone was ringing and uh, it's now registered. Okay, so let's take a look in the scripts to see uh, to see how it's done. So basically, uh, we're using the uh, exec module, and we're uh, doing running it in an asynchronous mode. Um, so when uh, here, when we try to do lookup and we don't find the user that's registered, we first thing we do is send an 180 ringing to make sure that the uh, caller hears something and it's not just dead air until the push notification, push notification is called. And we just execute our push notification scripts in an asynchronous mode. So basically we do not wait for any feedback. And uh, after that we do a little trick. We send a message to basically nowhere to simulate this asynchronous behavior. So the night port is uh, uh, port guaranteed to never get a reply. So basically, we're sending our SIP request there, and we're setting, sorry, uh, a timeout of two seconds. So basically, this is the uh, usual sequential forking be behavior. I try to nowhere, and in two seconds, I will get a timeout. So basically, it's, this is a trick to not block for that. We just uh, call the push notification script and uh, wait a couple of seconds to see if it works or not. And we are in this uh, failure out that will obviously be triggered strictly after two seconds. And uh, there we can uh, try to see if the user is registered. If not, we can either retry to call our script, so basically just put that code again here and retry as many times as we want. And obviously if it is registered now, we can simply uh, relate the call. So um, this would be a way to do it and not block your, uh, your open steps, um processes. But in this way you are forcing <coughs> your timeout always to two seconds, right? Yeah. 
you're, you're always you are waiting, even when the client returns after half a second, yeah. you're still waiting for well, a second. You can put that one second. You can put even, yes. One but second is no room in to continuously try. But it, it's second. much better in the sense that it's Maybe. never blocked. Another okay, you wait a little bit more, but it's a sync wait, it's not blocking wait. What about doing uh, forks for, for five different requests, each of different timeouts? <laughs> and then you can save this timeout. Uh, say what I mean with the ten branches, and then you get the winner. So that, that can be after five milliseconds or five seconds. No? You got more or less the same. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anything changes because you cannot control. Uh, but you don't know when the, the reply comes, or? No, no, there, is no, there is no reply in the idea that nobody replies from there, so you just wait, it's basically uh, an asynchronous sleep for two seconds. Yeah, but wait for two seconds. Yeah. But it can be that you have the answer faster than these two seconds, no? So you can do every one second, your timer can be one second, so you check every second and see if it's registered. Mm -hmm. But you can wait every half a second. And then you put a loop back. Yeah, you can put a loop back here. Yeah, I, I didn't. Uh, paste it here, but you can try as many times as you want. So you, you can do it at one second, the intervals, and uh, just keep trying. Is this not expensive? No. Uh, it's just using the transaction module, it's just like the usual failover, so it's it's very lightweight. Thank you. Okay. Is Alice trying to pay Bob? What? Is Alice trying to pay Bob? I'm not sure what's up with them. <laughs> Okay, so uh, here I've also pasted this code in case somebody needs it to do the presentation. So as a conclusion, open SIPs can help you do <coughs> lots of things, but the idea to use is to use the proper tool for the proper job. Like if it's MSRP, do not try to push media things into a SIP process, or if it's WebRTC, don't try to do things directly in the SIP proxy when it can be better done in another place. So, that's it.